this lecture is all about applying the ideal gas law to try to do a couple of different kinds of problems that we can find either in the laboratory or otherwise. The first of which is looking at gas density using the ideal gas law and the molar mass of the gas. And the second is gas phase stoichiometry where we apply those concepts of stoichiometry from chapter seven and now apply them to things that are occurring in the gas phase or that involve gas phase reactants or products and using the ideal gas law as our way of kind of interconverting between the two areas. So let's get started. So when it comes to gas density, we can calculate gas density by looking at the molar mass of a gas and its molar volume. Now the molar volume depends on a couple of factors. First of all, for STP, the molar volume is going to be 22.4 liters. And so that makes things really easy. We just take the molar mass, we divide it by 22.4 liters, and that gives us the density of the gas at STP. But um, what if we're not at STP? Well, then we have to follow a slightly different process that involves the ideal gas law. Now, keep in mind, for density, density is going to involve units of grams per liter. And how we usually get this is we would measure the mass of a gas just in a laboratory. Um, so we would take a sample of gas, weigh it on um, some kind of a balance, find out how much it weighs, and then turn around and, and find the volume from there. Um, using the ideal gas law, using some other things. And the volume here comes from volume is equal to NRT over P, the moles of gas times the um, constant times the Kelvin temperature divided by the pressure. And one of the places where this really applies is when we start looking at gas buoyancy. So looking at how do hot air balloons work? Why do uh, certain gases rise and other ones fall? Um, you know, why does a helium balloon raise up to the sky when a balloon filled with your own breath falls to the ground? Well, a lot of that has to do with gas density. Um, a lot of it has to do with the individual masses of those gases themselves. Um, and so there's, there's two factors that kind of go in. Obviously, molar mass is going to be one of them. We can see that the reason helium rises is because its density, 0.169 grams per liter, is considerably less than nitrogen, which makes up about 80% of our air, at 1.19. So, I mean, there's a eight, nine-fold difference in the densities there. And like with anything else, lower density rises, higher density falls, we see the helium balloon go up into the sky because of that density difference. But another way that we can come about this is with Charles Law. Charles Law gives, or if you recall from the last lecture, gives us the relationship between the volume of a gas and its temperature. And so we know that when we increase the temperature of a gas, that gas is going to expand considerably and since the amount of gas itself hasn't changed, we now have the same mass over a larger volume, we get a lower density as a result. And that's more or less how hot air balloons work. When we heat up the air inside of that hot air balloon, it causes the hot air balloon to expand. And now that same amount of trapped gas takes up more space and as a result, has a lower density. The lower density causes the balloon to go skyward. So let's take a look at an example of this. We are told nitric acid and sodium bicarbonate are mixing together and the reaction is taking place where gas is a product of the reaction. The gas has a density of 1.83 grams per liter at one atmosphere of pressure and 23 degrees Celsius. The question is, what is the molar mass and what is the identity of the gas? Well, the molar mass question we can answer pretty easily. 
all we need to do is figure out our mass and our number of moles, um, our, our molar mass. So molar mass would be moles of gas, oh, excuse me, would be the mass of the gas over the moles of the gas. Well, where do these numbers come from? Well, if I look at the density, the density gives me 1.83 grams of gas for every one liter of gas. And so from that perspective, we can look at this then and say, okay, I've got my mass of gas, it's 1.83 grams. Where does that moles come in? Well, I need to convert my one liter of gas into moles of gas. And that's where the ideal gas law is gonna come in. So N is equal to PV over RT. Pressure of the gas is 1.00 atmospheres. The volume of the gas is one liter. R is gonna be 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And my temperature, 23 degrees Celsius, is 296 Kelvin. So I do out that calculation. One divided by 0 0.08206 divided by 296 to three significant figures, 0 0.0412 moles of gas. I now have my mass of gas. 1.83 grams, my moles of gas, 0 0.0412 moles, 1.83 divided by 0 0.0412 gives me 44.4 grams per mole as my molar mass. So we've identified the first problem We've solved that 44.4 grams per mole is the answer. Now, what about the identity of the gas? Well, for that, we need the balanced chemical equation. And the balanced chemical equation would say that we've got nitric acid, HNO3, reacting with sodium bicarbonate. Now, this is a double replacement reaction. Sodium and hydrogen are gonna switch places. And so I get sodium nitrate and carbonic acid, H2CO3. Now, neither one of these products is a gas, first of all, and neither one of these products has a molar mass around 44. But one thing that we have to be careful of, one thing that we have to recognize is that carbonic acid never actually forms as a product. We can have carbonic acid dissolved in water as a reactant, but as a product, we know that carbonic acid does not actually exist as a product. What happens when we find carbonic acid as a product is we know that it undergoes a spontaneous decomposition, and that spontaneous decomposition results in water and carbon dioxide as a result. Now with this, now you have the potential for two different gaseous products, water, if the temperature's right, and carbon dioxide, which is almost always a gas. So logically speaking, carbon dioxide would be the one that we would assume is in the gas phase. Does it match up with the molar mass? Well, the molar mass for carbon dioxide is 44.01 
which isn't exactly that, but it's pretty darn close. And so within rounding error, certainly we would look at this and go, okay, yeah, I could see that. So that's example five. Now let's move on to the real reason we're here. And the real reason we're here is putting kind of an end cap on our stoichiometric calculations for this semester. Thus far, we've talked about calculations in stoichiometry for solids. We've talked about concentrations and, and solutions. We've talked about liquids. We've talked about kind of converting between particles and moles and grams and, and ions and all sorts of things. We haven't really accounted for gases yet. And where we can integrate gases into this conversation is with the ideal gas law. Because as we saw in the previous problem, I can solve for moles of any gas using the ideal gas law, N is equal to PV over RT. And furthermore, I can figure out the volume of a gas in a similar kind of manner by rearranging this equation again. Where if I take NRT over P, I can find the volume of a gas as well, which could be really important because again, volume is something that we can measure in the laboratory. So with these two manipulations of the ideal gas law, I have the capability to really solve any kind of problem with regard to stoichiometry. And now I can start to pair together concepts to cover a variety of different kinds of chemical reactions. And this pretty much covers all the, the, the possibilities. We know what to do when we have a solid or a pure liquid. We can weigh it. We can use the mass of that substance to figure out the number of moles and go into our stoichiometry from there. We saw in chapter eight, when we have a solution, we can use its molar concentration to do the same thing. Use the molarity, figure out the number of moles that are present, use that to do the stoichiometry. Now the, here's the last phase, here's the last piece, gases. And with this, we use the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law gives us the number of moles. And once we have moles, we're able to do pretty much any stoichiometric problem that we want. Now it's just a matter of putting it together, piecing it together. And so if we come back to this concept of the mole map, once again, we can put together, we can put together a volume of solution and tie it to moles using molarity or we can put in volume of gas and tie it together using the ideal gas law. So now we've got it covered from pretty much all of the different dimensions, masses, volumes of solution, volumes of gas. And obviously if we can do it to the one side, we can certainly do it to the other side. And again, everything comes back Two moles. That's the whole point of stoichiometry. If we can get it to moles, we can get it to work and use the balanced chemical equation to kind of tie everything together there. So let's do some example problems. Automobile airbags will inflate during the crash or a sudden stop by the rapid generation of nitrogen gas coming from sodium azide's decomposition. So the airbags in your car are filled with a solid called sodium azide. On sudden impact or sudden stop, 
Sodium azide basically decomposes. There's an electrical charge that gets impulsed. It causes the sodium azide to rapidly decompose and it rapidly decomposes into sodium metal and nitrogen gas. And the question here is how many grams of sodium azide are needed to produce sufficient nitrogen to fill a 48 by 48 by 25 centimeter bag to a pressure of 1.2 atmospheres and 15 degrees Celsius. So first things first, we need to figure out the amount, the volume of this bag. So if I take 48 times 48 times 24, I get to two significant figures, 55,000 centimeters cubed. Now keep in mind from your early conversions, we're going way back to chapter one cubic centimeters and milliliters are the same thing. So we're talking about 55,000 milliliters, which would be 55 liters. So now we have a pressure, we have a volume, we have a temperature. We've got all the makings to figure out what the number of moles are. And again, once we have the number of moles of gas, we can convert that into moles of sodium azide with the balanced chemical equation. And we can convert that into grams of sodium azide using the molar mass. So N is equal to PV over RT. Pressure here is 1.20 atmospheres. The volume here is 55 liters. R value for atmospheres, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per moles Kelvin. And 15 Celsius is 288 Kelvin. So if I put that together, 1.20 times 55 divided by 0.08206 divided by 288 to two significant figures, I get 2.8 moles of nitrogen. So that's how much nitrogen needs to be made. All that we need to do is convert that nitrogen into sodium azide using stoichiometry, 2.8 moles of nitrogen, Balanced chemical equation says three moles of nitrogen for every two moles of sodium azide. And the molar mass of sodium azide, 22.99 plus three times 14.01, one mole of sodium azide is 65.02 grams. And so putting all that together, 2.8 times 2 times 65.02 divided by 3 to, again, two significant figures, we would need about 120 grams of sodium azide. So that's quite a bit, but that's also quite a large airbag as well. 55 liters is a considerably large balloon. Um, so it would require uh, a good amount of space to do it. All right, let's take a look at another example. Actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and look at a different concept here. Now, let's suppose that we have a gas cylinder and it contains both nitrogen and oxygen gases. The question is this. How do we determine the total pressure of the gases? And how do you determine the individual pressures? So on your paper, go ahead and try to write down a couple of questions or, or a couple of answers to these questions. See what you can figure out. And we'll come back and we'll look at it in just about a minute. If you're watching on the YouTube, um, go ahead and just pause right now. See what you can come up with and then hit play again. 
All right, so how do we determine the total pressure of the gases? Well, that one's easy. We measure it. That's what a pressure gauge is all is for. So anytime we measure pressure using a pressure gauge, we're measuring the total pressure of the system, the all the pressure of all the gases that make up a, a system, make up the system. So when you take your tire pressure using a tire pressure gauge and it comes out 35 PSI, that means that the total pressure of all the gases inside of the is 35 PSI. And since most tires are filled with air instead of just pure nitrogen, um, that means that we've got a combination of nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas, and probably some trace amounts of others as well. And that all blends together. But to do the individual pressure, that's a little bit more difficult. It's gonna require another concept, another gas law for us to look into. And this one is called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. The concept here is relatively simple. If I have a mixture of gases, the total pressure of the gases is going to be the sum of all the individual pressures of all of the gases that make up the mixture. So if I have air, it's going to be the total pressure of the nitrogen plus the pressure of the oxygen plus the pressure of the carbon dioxide plus whatever else is in the air sample. Now to find any individual pressure, all I would need to do is take the mole fraction of that particular sample and multiply it by the total pressure. So if I wanna find the pressure of carbon dioxide, I would take the mole fraction of carbon dioxide and multiply it by the total pressure. And that would get me to where I need to go. And so that's all that's going on here. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, probably the most common example of this is when we collect gas over water. So take, for example, this decomposition reaction. Potassium chlorate gets heated up. And when it gets heated up, it decomposes into potassium chloride and oxygen gas. Ordinarily, this decomposition reaction is done in an apparatus that looks like this, where we can clearly see we've got a mixture of gases, or excuse me, we've got a mixture of solids here that are being heated and we can see that the bubbles are starting to form here and they go through the tubing and then they end up getting collected here. And in this space right here, we have a couple of things happening at the same time. In this space, we not only have the oxygen gas that was bubbling out, but because water vapor, because water is you know, volatile to at least a small degree, we have water vapor in that space as well. So the total pressure inside of this jar is equal to the pressure of the oxygen plus the pressure of the water vapor itself. And so if I do any kind of calculation regarding the pressure of the oxygen, we're trying to figure out how much oxygen was made using volume, using um, pressure, I have to throw that little bit in there. And so I usually end up having to find the vapor pressure of water at our given temperature just so that I can account for it and it doesn't throw off my value for the oxygen too badly. So here's an example where we can do just that. I've got a one liter flask. In that flask, I have 0 0.03 moles of oxygen, 150 milligrams of nitrogen, and 2.6 times 10 to the 21st molecules of carbon dioxide. What we wanna know is what is the partial pressure 
and the mole fraction for each gas. So there's a couple of concepts that are going on here at the same time. And we have to kind of go after them individually. So mole fraction, we can actually solve pretty quickly, pretty easily, because we know that we have 150 milligrams of nitrogen. So if there are a thousand milligrams and one gram and oops, 28.02 grams of nitrogen in every mole, then 150 divided by a thousand divided by 28.02 would give me two four significant figures, 0 0.005353 moles of nitrogen. And if I take in 2.6 times 10 to the 21st molecules, of CO2. I know that there are Avogadro's number of molecules in every mole. 2.6 times 10 to the 21st divided by Avogadro's number would give me 0 0.0043 um, moles of carbon dioxide. And then we are also told we have 0 0.03 moles of oxygen. So if I add those together, 0 0.03 plus 0 0.0043 plus 0 0.005353, To our calculator spits out 0 0.039653 moles in total. However, we are bound by significant figures here. Three decimal places for oxygen, four for carbon dioxide, and six for nitrogen. Only three decimal places will be preserved. And so that means that we are rounding that nine. So all in all, it's gonna be 0 0.040 moles in total. So we have mole counts and we have a total number of moles, we can do part, we can do uh, mole fractions, mole fraction of nitrogen, 0 0.005353 over 0 is 0.13 mole fraction of carbon dioxide is 0 0.0043 over 0 0.04. which would be the two significant figures 0.11. The mole fraction of oxygen would be what's left. So one minus 0.13 minus 
which would be 0.76. So we've solved the second part of the equation. We've got the mole fraction of each gas. Now, how do we determine the partial pressures overall? Well, for that, we're going to need the total pressure overall. And that's where that total is going to come in handy. So I've got my three mole fractions. I now have, because of the work that we did before, that the total number of moles is 0 0.04 moles. And so I can use that to figure out the pressure. Pressure is equal to NRT over V. N is 0 0.040 moles. R is going to be 0.36. He's going to be uh, 62.36 liters times tor over moles times Kelvin. 25 degrees Celsius is 298 Kelvin. And my volume is a one liter flask. My pressure in total is 0 0.04 multiplied by 62.36 multiplied by 298 to two significant figures, it is 740 tor. Now that I have this, I can just multiply this over each mole fraction and get each of the individual partial pressures. So pressure of nitrogen is equal to 0 0.13 times 740. which would be 96 tor. The pressure of carbon dioxide would be 0.11 times 740. Which would be 81 tor. And the pressure of oxygen would be what is left or 0 0.76 times 740 which would be 560 tor. Now if you had done the subtraction um, 740 minus 96 minus 81 Calculator would have come up with 563, but remember this is the last significant digit in the 740, so you have rounded that to 560 as well. Um, now, you might look at this and go, well, why don't they add up to the total? Again, with so few significant figures, that's not always going to happen because we have to be true to our level of estimation. We cannot just simply invent precision to accommodate a relatively imprecise reading. And 740 tor with only two significant figures would be a relatively imprecise reading. So this is kind of a application of Dalton's law, kind of on steroids. There's a lot going on here, but you can kind of see how it all fits together, where we integrate in things like the ideal gas law, how we use our concepts of mole fraction, which we hadn't talked about since chapter 11. Um, 
and then putting that all together to kind of figure out what the gases themselves would look like. All right, this is a more simple example. Um, again, if you are watching on YouTube or on Zoom, go ahead and pause the video right now and try to kind of work through this yourself before you find the answer. Um, otherwise, um, go ahead and let it roll here and we'll come back and, and go through this. All right, so this is the exact reaction that we were looking at in the previous, in the uh, picture example with the Bunsen burner and collecting the sample over water. We have a sample of potassium chlorate and we're heating it and it's gonna decompose to produce oxygen gas. The total volume of the collected gas is 329 milliliters at a pressure of 744 torr. How many moles of oxygen are formed in total. So how many moles of oxygen are we going to get here? Well, the one thing that we don't know that we need to know is since we're dealing with a reaction that generates oxygen, but also will give us water vapor because of the nature of our collection method. We know that the pressure of the total atmosphere is gonna be equal to the pressure of the oxygen, which is what we're interested in, and the pressure of the water vapor itself. Now, any reference text would give this to you. Um, in fact, most, most online resources are getting pretty good with this, even you know, even traditionally uh, derided ones like Wikipedia or others, um, the at this temperature, the vapor pressure of water is going to be right around 21.8 torr. Different references are going to give slightly different values. They're all going to kind of center around this rough idea in the middle here, which means that if my total was 744 torr and my water is 21.8 torr, then the pressure of the oxygen itself would have to be 722 torr. Again, 744 minus 21.8 would give us 722.2. I have to round it because the pressure of the gas in total is only known to the ones place. I can't add extra digits just to accommodate what the calculator tells me. So I've got a pressure, I've got a volume, I've got a temperature, I've got everything I need for moles. So from that standpoint, N is equal to PV over RT. The pressure here is 722 torr. The volume is 329 milliliters, which would be 0.329 liters. R, 62.36 liters times torr over moles times Kelvin. And 25 degrees is 298 Kelvin. So 722 times 0.329, divided by 62.36, divided by 298. My value here for moles to three significant figures, 0 0.0128 moles of oxygen. If I had not done that calculation first, if I had not reduced the pressure from 744 to 722 to account for the water, I would have come up with a slightly different value, um, which would have affected a number of calculations down the line. So getting into things like um, theoretical yield, experimental uh, yield, percent yield kinds of things. So these little manipulations, they do make a difference and you need to be aware of them. 
We're going to end our discussion of gases by looking at what are, so, are called real gases. Now, up until this point, we've been talking about ideal gases. Ideal gases are ones that obey the ideal gas law, obey the kinetic molecular theory. Real gases are ones where we know that the conditions are not exactly perfect for the ideal gas law to be followed, well, ideally, exactly. So what happens in there? Where do we see these? Well, primarily we see these in two places. When we have smaller volumes and lower temperatures, then we go back and we look at, well, hold on a second. Our ideal gas law may not be so applicable. Why smaller volumes? Well, we have to think about some of our assumptions. We assume the gas particles have no volume. relative to the container size. However, if we shrink down the volume enough, those particles are going to take up a considerable part of the container volume, and we are going to have to account for that. Um, with temperature, we assumed that these particles do not attract each other. But we may not be able to do that now. If they're, not, if they're moving slowly enough that their interactions are not just these rapid collisions of an elastic nature, we may not be able to assume that they're just going to never interact with each other, that they don't have polarity forces or nonpolar forces the, to kind of hold them together. Now, even in these circumstances, that doesn't mean that we have to completely throw out everything that we just talked about. All it means is that we have to correct for it. So kind of recapping, we assumed in kinetic molecular theory, number one, that the volume of the gas was gonna be negligible to the volume of the container. And we also assumed in number five that the gas molecules are going to act independently of each other, that they won't interact. At STP, those were valid assumptions. At higher pressures, lower volumes, lower temperatures, we see that we have non-negligible volumes. We have attractive forces that actually exist. And again, what we have to focus on here is that this doesn't mean that we completely throw out everything we just talked about. What it means is that we start to correct for it. And the correction is something called the Van der Waals equation. So I'll come back to those graphs in just a second. The Van der Waals equation tells us that if we correct for those things on two of our variables, we can still use a form of the ideal gas law. The correction here, this is a pressure correction. And this accounts for attractive forces. And this is a volume correction. To account for particle sizes. Now, most of these are variables that we already have. So Notice that N is a big part of both of these. The volume of the container is a big part of the pressure correction because 
since they are so intimately related with each other, the values of A and B are gas specific. Meaning that carbon dioxide is going to have a different value of A and B than water vapor will, than nitrogen will, than uh, sulfur trioxide will. And that is in part because of the different sizes of the molecules, but also the different attractive forces that are going to play a role in them. Um, and so how do these real gases, um, how do these uh, deviations actually look? Well, we can see in the graph here that the purple line represents what we would anticipate based on the ideal gas law. And we can see that most lines are gonna, most of these gases are going to uh, create two different kinds of deviations. There's gonna be a negative deviation here where we have attractions between the gas mar uh, molecules and each other. And you'll notice that for the three gases that are listed, look at which ones are affected the most. Hydrogen, these are all nonpolar gases, methane, hydrogen, carbon dioxide. What's the big difference between them? Molar mass. Hydrogen gas has virtually no negative deviation whatsoever. Um, because it has such few London dispersion forces because it has such a small molar mass that it really doesn't deviate too much. Molar mass of 16 for, um, uh, for uh, the uh, methane here. And we do see that it does have a negative deviation associated with attraction. Molar mass of 44 for carbon dioxide, we see a much sig more significant attraction dip as well. The rebound here comes from our assumptions on the particle size. And we can see that um, all three gases are gonna have significant impacts um, what you really want to look at here are the slopes of the lines, um, the uh, uh, idea of size. Um, and we can see that the methane here has kind of probably the most um, positive slope. And that's got to do with its structure. Having that tetrahedral shape, um, it's going to take up more space than the linear shape of carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide is going to take up way more space than the hydrogen. You can look at the slope. The slope of the line here for carbon dioxide is much more steep than it is for hydrogen. Even though at the pressure, we're going to get a higher deviation for hydrogen, its, it's gradual build is going to be a lot less. So that's it for gases for us. Um, that concludes our look into chapter nine here.